Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Uh, it's a pleasure today to introduce Jonathan Strauss, who's been a member of our faculty for a long time, um, and he's been uh, somebody who I've worked with very closely over the years in the breast cancer world. And he also has several different hats he wears within uh, the Department of Radiation Oncology, and including the Associate Chair for Education. And what he's going to be talking about today is really uh, the biology behind uh, radiation uh, techniques that are applied for breast and gynecologic malignancies. What we've seen over the last several years, certainly in the breast cancer world, is a changing landscape of schedules and techniques. And, you know, it's not something they just think of down in the basement. They actually have a rationale for doing these things. At least I've always been told they do. So what we're going to hear is, um, you know, some of the results and uh, from those trials, as well as the underpinnings for why those uh, trials were undertaken in the first place. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. Please pose them in the chat, as well as not be bashful towards the end. If you have a question, uh, we'll make sure that we get as many in. Uh, with the time that's allowed. So with that, Jonathan, welcome, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. I appreciate it. And here, let me share my screen, and we will jump in. And so, um, like Dr. Greisher said, I, I treat breast and gynecologic cancers, and so that's what I'm going to focus on today. The, the biggest change, I would say, from when I trained until now is that we've moved from kind of a focus on clinical pathologic variables to really more and more incorporating biology into a lot of our decision making. And I want to think about that in the context of both breast and gynecologic cancers, although I would say that is true kind of probably across the board. Um, and so again, in gynecologic cancers, we really started with clinical pathologic variables. And so, you know, by way of that, I'll give examples of a couple trials that we'll then reanalyze later. But we look at stage one endometrial cancer and we can start with the PORTEC-1 or GOG-99 trials. These are trials that just took women with stage 1 endometrial cancer um, who'd had a hysterectomy and randomized them plus or minus pelvic radiotherapy. And this was done in an old-fashioned way, a three-field or four-field box. And what we saw pretty clearly, if we looked at all comers, was that radiotherapy reduced the risk of local regional recurrence, which is not surprising. That's what radiotherapy does. But we started to wonder, you know, do we really have to irradiate everyone so that we address the 15% of folks who are destined to have a local regional recurrence, or can we select patients more carefully? And really all we had to do for that was to look at clinical pathologic risk factors. And we could define these differently, but essentially older age, higher grade, deeper invasion were all associated with a higher risk of recurrence. And we could put those together into our high intermediate risk group and see both a larger absolute risk of pelvic recurrence and so a larger absolute benefit from radiotherapy. And this was what we did for a long time. And I will say that if we look at the patterns of failure within the pelvis, what we could see in the unradiated arm was that most of the recurrences were in the upper vagina, which led to the question of whether we really needed to irradiate the entire pelvis or whether we could focus the treatment on the upper vaginal vault. And that brings us to PORTEC-2 trial, which took a similar population of patients and randomized them between vaginal brachytherapy, treating only the upper vagina, versus external beam or pelvic radiotherapy. And what we could see, not surprisingly, if we look at long-term follow-up, is that we reduced non-vaginal pelvic recurrences by using external beam as compared to vaginal brachytherapy, and by contrast, all of the other oncologic endpoints were identical. Vaginal recurrences, which comprise post, most pelvic recurrences, were identical, as was distant recurrence and overall survival. But as you would imagine, the toxicity was considerably less when we focused the radiotherapy just on the upper vagina. And for that reason, vaginal brachytherapy became the preferred treatment in this patient population asterisk. And that asterisk is, boy, if we knew who the 6% of patients were who were destined to have a pelvic recurrence, wouldn't we just love to give them external beam? The trouble was clinical pathologic variables weren't great at telling us who these patients were. 
And so that led us to a series of consensus statements. On the left, we see the American Astro Consensus, and on the right, we see the European ESMO Astro Consensus Statement, but that were very similar and use these clinical pathologic variables to decide on treatment and that really didn't have a great way of finding those high risk stage one patients for whom we should be selecting pelvic or external beam radiotherapy. And another way to make those decisions if we didn't want to use those guidelines was to use some sort of a nomogram to estimate risk, again on the basis of clinical pathologic variables, and then set some threshold of risk above which we might select external beam radiotherapy. Again, pretty straightforward and all based on clinical pathologic variables. And here I see, I show just how we use a nomogram in this case, which is just selecting each of these variables and using them to sum the scores and then predict the local regional relapse. We started to creep our way towards biology with this first analysis that looked not just at lymphovascular space invasion as a binary, but looking at it along a spectrum. And so dividing patients into not only LVI absent, but also focally present versus substantial or extensive. And what we could see was that focal LVI actually really, those patients did about the same as patients without lymphovascular invasion. But then there was a small group of women with extensive LVI who had a much higher rate of non-vaginal pelvic recurrence, basically six-fold higher. And so it really looked like these patients might actually be great candidates for external beam radiotherapy because their rate of a pelvic recurrence in the absence of external beam radiotherapy was not 6%, but more like 20%. But now we move forward into the modern era and start to incorporate not just clinical pathologic variables, but molecular variables. And this started with an analysis out of the TCGA that divided all endometrial cancer into four molecular subtypes. And as we could see by prognosis, these four molecular subtypes had wildly disparate prognostic um, outcomes. And so what we saw was the pole E mutants those that were ultra mutated actually had an excellent prognosis. Those patients who were MMRD or had mismatch repair protein deficiencies had an intermediate prognosis. Those patients who were what we call copy number high or which correlates quite well with the immunohistochemical finding of P53 mutation had a very poor prognosis and everyone else was grouped together into this copy number low or non-specific molecular profile. This actually accounts for at least half of all patients and they also had an intermediate prognosis. When this classification was taken to the PORTEC trials that we just looked at, PORTEC 1 and 2, what we could see was that the four molecular subtypes were associated with quite disparate outcomes, with pole e ultramutated patients doing exceedingly well, and P53-driven um, or copy number high patients doing quite poorly, and everyone else intermediate. And what this suggests is we may now be able to tailor our treatment intensity de-escalating for those patients with a great prognosis and escalating intensity for those patients who had a poor prognosis with um, kind of standard of care treatment. Another analysis was done of the PORTEC-2 patients, this time incorporating extensive lymph vascular invasion and a couple of molecular signatures, P53 mutation, which again is a correlate of the copy number high group, or L1 cam expression greater than 10%, if any of those unfavorable features were present, patients did quite poorly with vaginal brachytherapy alone. And in the absence of those features, patients really did equivalently with either vaginal brachytherapy or pelvic radiotherapy. And this really helps us to select the small subset of patients who really should be receiving pelvic radiotherapy. And we can see on multivariable analysis that these hold up, that external beam, uh, the extent of lymph vascular invasion, P53 mutation, and L1 chem expression, although this loses statistical significance, it still probably looks real. And then there's analysis of a pooled uh, population from PORTEC 1 and 2 using this molecular classification. And again, what we see is those patients with polymutants did amazing, regardless of the treatment that they got, including no external, beam, no radiotherapy at all. We could see that MMRD patients and nonspecific molecular profile did very well and seemed to do very well with vaginal brachytherapy, although the nonspecific molecular profile did a little worse when they got nothing. 
And then we could see that those patients with P53 abnormal did much better when they got external beam radiotherapy and actually fairly poorly when they got either no treatment or vaginal brachytherapy. Um, we could also see the patterns of failure where they tended to recur. We can see that those patients who were MMRD were more likely to have a non-vaginal pelvic recurrence, and this probably relates to the fact that they're more likely to have extensive lymphascular invasion, and that may reflect the small subset of these patients who would benefit from external beam. And interestingly, we're starting to see some data that this kind of really umbrella category of nonspecific molecular profile may be able to be further subdivided. And those patients with nonspecific molecular profile who express the estrogen receptor seem to do much better than those patients in the nonspecific molecular profile group who are estrogen receptor negative. And this may help us to further refine treatment decisions. And I will say, although the American guidelines stick entirely with clinical pathologic variables, that is not true on the European side. They've really moved. And these are the new ESMO practice guidelines, which incorporate not just clinical pathologic variables, but also the four molecular subtype classification in making treatment recommendations. Having said that, the Europeans were also waiting for the results of PORTEC 4A, which was a prospective randomized trial making use of these molecular subtypes to make decisions. And so in this trial, patients with high intermediate risk stage one disease were randomized to either everyone getting vaginal brachytherapy, which was the standard arm, or a more tailored approach in which low risk patients received observation, intermediate risk patients got vaginal brachytherapy, and high risk patients got external beam radiotherapy and those high-risk patients being those with substantial LVI or P53 mutation, again, a copy number high, essentially equivalent, or greater than 10% L1 CAM expression. In those patients who were poly or otherwise very low risk received observation. And in the more locally advanced setting, I would say there's now an umbrella category of prospective trials ongoing within the European system in which patients with P53 abnormality all receive chemo radiotherapy and the randomization is plus or minus aloparib, looking at escalation of therapy within the P53 mutant group who are doing not very well with chemo radiotherapy. Within the MMRD group, there's the addition of immunotherapy. And this seems to make great sense because these MMRD MMR deficient tumors, whether it's an endometrial cancer or other cancers, seem to respond extremely well to immunotherapy. In fact, I think ultimately the question may be whether we can deescalate everyone else and give them immuno everything else, give them immunotherapy alone. Non-specific molecular profile patients were adding a, a hormonal treatment to them, although my suspicion is this may work better on those that subset the majority of patients who have an estrogen receptor positive disease, but we'll see. And then the polymutants were looking at de-escalation, although they also have an exploratory cohort that may get radiotherapy, but I will say they really seem to do very well with no treatment. And so I'll transition from this point to just some data that our group has done here. We've worked with a wonderful resident um, named Steve in our department. Uh, who has done a really a great job with this project and that was presented in long form oral at Estro this year. So, so we looked not just at poly, but at poll D1. And let's talk a little bit about this. So poll E is the major catalytic and proofreading subunit of the leading strand of DNA and DNA synthesis. But there is a corresponding protein, poll D1, that has the exact same role in the lagging strand of DNA synthesis. And the question is whether POLD1 mutations might have some of the same underlying features as poll e mutations. And it does certainly look like in previous data, POLD1 mutations can trigger the accumulation of a high tumor mutational burden and so enhance immune response. And so I would say we took three publicly available data sets, the AACR Genie, the MSK um, Met, and the TCGA endometrial cancer subset to kind of answer some questions within the space. The first thing we could see is that the distribution of histology of POLD1 looks a lot like poll e So if we look at patients who are wild type for both poll e and poll d one although they have primarily endometrioid histology, they also have a good amount of carcinosarcoma and serous types. If we look at poly variants, it's clear they have only endometrioid histology, which is to say they're associated with the most favorable histologic subtype. The same was true for patients who had both poly and poly one variants. 
but it pretty much was true with those patients with POLD1 variants only. And now may be a good time to point out that we have identified which POLD E mutants are pathogenic. We aren't sure which POLD1 mutants are pathogenic. So we had to include all the variants of POLD1, which means some of them are probably pathogenic and so associated with that same better um, prognosis, and some probably aren't pathogenic and those haven't been sorted out yet. Having said that, when we looked at the median tumor mutational burden, and here we can see that poli mutants are far above the median mutational burden of those patients who are poli and poli one wild type. Similarly, we can still see that poli one variants have a much higher mutational burden, and those patients with poli and poli one variants had the highest mutational burden. What about their prognosis? Well, again, it looks like patients with poli and poli one variants do much better than those patients with poli and poli one wild type. And we'll see why we separated by race in a minute, but it does look like black patients in America seem to do very well with poli or poli one variants as compared to wild type. And even when we look by certain other variables, whether it's race or histology or TP53 status, it still seemed that having a POLD1 mutation was uh, favorable after adjusting for other variables, albeit in these subset analyses, we do start to lose statistical power. But what we found was quite interesting, and after we found it, it turned out that other people had already found it, but what we found was that black patients seem to have very low rates of pole E mutations. And so when we're looking at therapeutic escalation, this seemed to be something that didn't, excuse me, therapeutic de-escalation, this seemed to be something that didn't really apply to black populations in America. This is an important finding, we think, because most of these data sets are coming out of the European groups, and the European groups just have less ethno-racial diversity to work with in their data sets. And this is part of the reason why an American data set brings some additional interesting information. What we found, and it turned out had replicated, was that these poli mutations were quite rare in black patients. By contrast, poli one mutations appear to be much closer in black patients in prevalence to those seen in other racial groups. So if it holds up that poli one is associated with excellent prognosis and perhaps can be uh, used for therapeutic de-escalation, this may apply somewhat more evenly across racial groups than the poli e mutation. So kind of in summary of those findings, polypathogenic mutations are associated with a favorable prognosis. They carry the potential for therapeutic de-escalation. This is now standard of practice in Europe, not so much in the U.S. at least quite yet, while we wait for the portec 4 a trial to come out. But it's also important to note that POLD1 performs quite a similar molecular function to poly, just on the lagging strand of DNA instead of the leading strand. These mutations do appear to be associated with this more favorable endometrioid histology in a similar way to poli, also associated with a higher mutational burden in a similar way to poli. E. Whereas poli D1 mutations are quite rare in, rare in black women, poli D mutations appear to be somewhat more evenly distributed across racial groups, potentially broadening the population for targeted de-escalation. And so we're interested to see if in other series it holds up that poli D1 mutations are associated with uh, higher with a lower risk and potentially we might wonder also a higher benefit to immunotherapy. So this is a cool area of, of research and our next plan as a group is to really look to identify which pol D1 mutations are pathogenic, which will help us be a little more targeted in the future in trying to identify those patients who might qualify for de-escalation. I'm going to pivot in a minute to using biology, incorporating biology in breast cancer in a couple of settings uh, as well. I'll first catch my breath. So let's take a look at what we're doing in breast cancer and where biology is starting to come into play. So here's some classic data where we could see that the addition of whole breast radiotherapy in breast cancer was associated with a substantial reduction in first recurrence and an improvement in overall survival. This overall survival improvement was measurable but relatively small in patients with node negative disease and much more prominent in patients with node positive disease. And in addition to treating the whole breast, there's a question of whether we should be adding radiotherapy to regional lymph nodes and whether we should be doing radiotherapy after mastectomy. And so we have a couple of more recent trials that were 
helpful in this scenario. These were the MA20 trial and the EORTC22922 trial. And essentially, these were patients with mostly node positive disease, but not entirely, who got radiotherapy to their breast or chest wall after their breast surgery, who, and were randomized plus or minus radiation to the regional lymph nodes. And what did we see? But in these you know, mostly node positive, but relatively lower risk patients, what we could see is after we already gave radiotherapy to the breast or chest wall, incrementally adding radiotherapy to the regional nodes incrementally improved outcomes. Here we can see in the MA20 trial, it reduced the risk of a local regional recurrence, improved distant disease-free survival, so reduced the chance of a distant metastasis by about 4%, improved disease-free survival by about 5%, and appeared to have a hint towards overall survival that did not achieve statistical significance. And we can see similar findings from the EORTC22922 group. In this case, breast cancer mortality was clearly reduced by about 3% with the addition of regional nodal irradiation on top of irradiating the breast or chest wall. The challenge with these data is when we looked at a forest plot, where we looked at different clinical and pathologic variables, what we saw was everything is to the left of the line. In other words, every subgroup of patients has a modest benefit from regional nodal irradiation. And obviously what we'd like to identify is which patients have a substantial benefit and which patients derive no benefit. And unfortunately, our classic clinical pathologic variables just weren't helpful in getting us there because really every subgroup we looked at seemed to derive the same small but measurable benefit. So where does that leave us? Well, again, it's clear that regional nodal irradiation, perhaps postmastectomy radiation, yield a clear benefit. In some populations, this benefit may be quite modest. But how can we identify these populations when clinical pathologic variables don't seem to work? Well, it turns out that our medical oncology colleagues have been doing this cool thing, which is giving the chemotherapy before surgery in a lot of patients. At first, as radiation oncologists, we kind of panicked because we said, well, we're going to lose pathologic information. We're not going to know how many nodes were positive in these patients. But we gained something that might be more valuable, and that is we learned about biology. We learned about the response to chemotherapy. So can we incorporate that? Can we begin to incorporate biology into breast cancer? Well, let's have a look. And when we look at medical oncology data, the first one we can see is a pathologic complete response is associated with improved outcomes. And this is true for all breast cancer subtypes. It's true for those patients who are estrogen receptor positive, and well behaved like the luminal A's, or poorly behaved like the luminal B's, those patients who were ER negative but HER2 positive and triple negative. Anyone who exhibits a pathologic complete response has better outcomes. That said, not everyone is equally likely to exhibit a pathologic complete response, but those patients with ER negative disease much more likely. This is becoming really important to us for the following reason. When I was a resident, you know, we read the NSABP B18 trial and we saw that when we gave adriamycin and cytoxan before surgery, we had a pathologic complete response rate of 13%. With the addition of a taxane in B27, we could double that to 26%. It was still relatively rare. But nowadays, when we look at the Keynote 522 trial and we're incorporating platinums and taxane and anthracyclines and immunotherapy and for triple negative breast cancers, we're now seeing pathologic complete response rates variably defined as being in the 60 to 70%. When we look at those patients with HER2 positive breast cancer and we look at TCHP and the Christine trial, again, we're looking at ranges that go as high up as over 70% for those patients who are ER, PR negative and HER2 positive, which means that pathologic complete response has gone from something that was rare to something that is common, even normal for patients with ER negative disease. So if we can use that piece of information to make radiotherapy decisions, it's going to affect a lot of patients. So what data do we have? Well, we started with some pooled analyses of prospective randomized trials that were randomized for chemotherapy decisions. And then we looked retrospectively at radiotherapy. And what we did see was whereas those patients who exhibited a complete response in the lymph nodes seemed to derive very, seemed to do extremely well with local regional recurrence and therefore derive no clear benefit from radiotherapy, those patients with residual nodal burden um, 
did not nearly as well, they were at much higher rate of having a local regional recurrence and therefore derived a much clearer benefit from radiotherapy. So a suggestion that we could use pathologic complete response to make radiotherapy decisions, albeit this is a non-randomized and retrospective analysis of a prospective systemic therapy trial. And Bruce Hafty did the same thing for the ACASAG Z1071 trial, where we could see that whereas radiotherapy was really clearly beneficial when we looked at all patients who underwent mastectomy in this trial, and it was very clearly beneficial for those patients who did not achieve a pathologic complete response in the axilla, it lost statistical significance for those patients who did achieve a pathologic complete response. Again, pointing the way towards perhaps response to systemic therapy as being an important contributor to radiotherapy decisions. Our first prospective trial was a single arm trial by the Dutch, so BOOG 2010-3. In this trial took relatively low risk patients. They had to be early stage clinically, T1 to T2 clinical N1 disease. So it had to be biopsy proven, but they couldn't have N2 or N3 disease. They got neoadjuvant chemotherapy and surgery, and then prospectively were assigned to different radiotherapy groups um, by risk. So those patients who were low risk, meaning they had a complete response in the nodes, got radiotherapy to the breast only after lumpectomy and no radiotherapy after mastectomy. High-risk patients, which is to say those with significant residual nodal burden after neoadjuvant chemo, got comprehensive radiotherapy. And low-risk patients, which is to say everyone in the middle, got radiotherapy um, to the chest wall only. And the, what we can see is that the five-year rate of isolated local regional recurrence is actually low in each of these groups, su su suggesting that this strategy worked fairly well in identifying patients for whom we could de-escalate radiotherapy approaches. I will point out that actually more than half of all local regional recurrences were not isolated. So this two to two and a half percent rate of local regional recurrence is really more like 5% or something when we account for those patients for whom local Local regional recurrence is presented concurrently with some other finding. Um, and I would say this didn't apply quite equally across subgroups. Um, those patients with triple negative disease, high grade, and who did not have a pathologic complete response in the primary tumor remained at somewhat higher risk. And this still actually bugs me that I think a pathologic complete response in the nodes, but having residual disease in the breast is not really as good as having a complete response in both uh, regions. But now we move um, to the NSABP B51 trial. So this is our first prospective randomized trial making radiotherapy decisions in light of systemic therapy response. So this is really how we make decisions. And this took 1,600 patients with clinical T1 to T3 N1 disease. So you did not qualify if you had clinical N2 or N3 disease. They all got neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and they were eligible for randomization if they exhibited a pathologic complete response in the nodal basin. Four-fifths of these patients also exhibited a pathologic complete response in the breast. So I'm not certain how applicable these data are to that small subset of patients who have residual disease in the breast. These, these data have been presented, but not yet published in a peer-reviewed journal. What do we see? What we see is that oncologically, it looks pretty sound to omit either post-mastectomy radiotherapy or regional nodal radiotherapy in this patient population. Um, although regional Local regional relapse-free survival looks numerically different, favoring radiotherapy. Not surprising. That's what we always do is reduce local regional occurrences. Even that barely misses statistical significance. And more importantly, I think none of these other endpoints have a hint towards being improved. Distant relapse-free survival, disease-free survival, and overall survival, with the caveat that it is early to look at these endpoints in a local therapy trial. Still, I would say that the best data we have currently is really leaning us towards de-escalation of radiotherapy in the setting of patients who were eligible for B51, and I would say especially in those patients who exhibited a complete response in the breast and nodes. I will say I have not seen a consensus opinion congeal in the radiotherapy world about how we should be applying these data, um, and I still see a great variation in kind of radiotherapy decision making um, despite complete response to systemic therapy, but I will say at least for myself, I'm starting to omit radiotherapy or regional nodal irradiation 
much more frequently in this population of patients who are eligible for, and I would say well represented on the B51 trial, even as we wait for maturity of these data, I think the best data I have right now are telling me I should be backing off patients who are just doing great um, despite omission of radiotherapy. And really our last topic for the day I want to pivot to is the opposite end of the clinical and biologic spectrum, which is to say, not people with aggressive ER negative breast cancers that are responding great to systemic therapy, but patients with small biologically indolent estrogen receptor positive breast cancers and thinking about using biology to deescalate in that population as well. It's important to point out that although we know there is a small but detectable survival advantage for patients with no negative disease for radiotherapy and breast cancer, it's not clear that that is evenly distributed across all patients with no negative disease. And instead, what we can see in meta-analysis is that those patients with higher risk node negative disease, or at least those who came from trials in which higher risk patients were included, appear to derive a real survival advantage from radiotherapy with their absolute reduction in any recurrence on the x-axis corresponding to an absolute reduction in breast cancer death on the y-axis. By contrast, those patients who come out of trials with intermediate or low risk no negative breast cancer, we can clearly see a smaller but detectable reduction in first recurrence, but not so clearly see the survival advantage. And this suggests that we may be able to identify a population for de-escalation. And if we look just at randomized trials across time, the secular trend is towards lower rates of local regional recurrence. There are probably many reasons for this finding that include better surgical technique, more careful pathologic assessment, and improved radiographic imaging, but mostly I think it's better systemic therapy. Um, so what we can see with local recurrence declining over time is that we may not need to apply the same intensity of radiotherapy to all patients. And so I would say I like to divide this literature into three generations of randomized trials. The first generation of trials took relatively unselected patients and tried to omit radiotherapy, and that was relatively unsuccessful and led us to say radiotherapy is an obligate component of breast conservation. But the second generation of trials, at least as I define it, did something a little different. So this is what I call the second generation of trials. It's in women who are pretty much over the age of 50 or 65 or 70 with T1 and 0 ER positive breast cancers getting an anti-estrogen. And what you can see about all of these trials, by the way, regardless of age, whether they're over 70 or 65 or 50, what you can see are actually very similar data. That with endocrine therapy alone, their five-year rate of local regional recurrence was four to 6%, centering around 5%. And with radiotherapy, it was a half to 2%, centering around 1%. So 5% down to 1% in basically all of these trials. Many of these trials now have 10-year follow-up data. And what you can see is that these risks exactly doubled. So ballpark 10% down to 2% without any clear survival advantage, recapitulating what we saw in our meta-analysis, which is to say, omission of radiotherapy for patients who fit into this group and are receiving endocrine therapy is reasonable. And having said that, their, their risk of recurrence with endocrine therapy alone is small but not tiny. You know, it, it, these risks trickle in at about 1% a year for at least the first 10 years. And so the question really becomes, can we refine even better our selection criteria to really identify a patient population we feel very comfortable omitting radiotherapy and using an endocrine therapy alone strategy for? How might we do this? Well, let's bring in biology. So at first we could see that when we looked in prospective chemotherapy trials and obtained an oncotype recurrence score for those, or 21 gene recurrence score, if we will, for those patients with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, it wasn't only associated with distant recurrence, which is what we get on that form it sends back, it was also associated with the rate of local regional recurrence, with patients who had a high oncotype score having a higher rate of local regional recurrence, and those who score coming in low having the lowest rate of local regional recurrence at least as local regional recurrence as a first event, suggesting that 
oncotype score or some other biologic uh, parameter or molecular signature may be a useful addition to the clinical pathologic variables in identifying patients for de-escalation. And we have now variably defined six or seven ongoing or just presenting prospective biomarker-based omission trial. I'll say the Danish trial that gets included in this, it's not so clear to me it's biomarker-based, but all of the others are. The two American trials are using oncotype recurrence scores. So we have the IDEA trial that's presented and now published very early data, and we have the DEBRA trial, which is an ongoing randomized trial that I have been trying with mixed success to enroll patients to. And then we have other trials. We have European trials that are using the PAM50 score to try to select patients. We have the primetime trial that's using a series of immunohistochemical um, stains. The Lumina trial that's using some immunohistochemistry as well as just KI67 in carefully selecting patients. And we're going to look in a minute at the early data from these trials. So what do we see? Well, the Lumina trial, which enrolled women 55 years and older with T1N0 ER positive breast cancer, grades two or three, but notably a KI67 that's quite low, less than 13 and a quarter. 500 patients were enrolled, a median follow up of five years. And what do we see at their five year rate of local recurrence, which should be about 5% if we weren't using a molecular marker, instead is about 2%. So the hint is, although we don't have a comparison arm, if we compare it to earlier trials, the hint is that adding KI67 has yielded a lower five-year rate of local regional recurrence um, than just clinical pathologic variables alone. I have one concern about trials like this and why I really want longer follow-up, which is, are these indolent tumors less likely to recur or do they just recur later? And that's what I want to be sure of before we start adopting this strategy off study. Similarly, we have the precision trial, which used ProSigna or PAM50. It enrolled patients 50 to 75 years old, again with low risk clinical pathologic features. So they're T1N0, ERPR positive, grade one to two, margins negative. And they've presented very early data, so two year data. Again, historically, local regional recurrence should have been about 2%. And instead, if we use clinical pathologic variables only, and instead it's 0.3%. Again, suggesting that at least for short-term follow-up, adding some molecular signature is even better perhaps than just clinical pathologic variables. And we have the IDEA trial that's presented and now very recently published. So this used Oncotype, enrolled 200 patients age 50 to 70 with T1N0 disease and an Oncotype recurrence score, 21 gene recurrence score less than or equal to 18. And what we see is these patients do extremely well and their five-year rate of relapse-free survival was 99%, meaning they had two local regional recurrences of these 200 patients within years one to five. However, there is this hint that's a little troubling, which is in the next two years, they had six more local regional occurrences. So again, my question is, is this rate going to be lower? Hopefully, maybe. Or is it going to be later? And I do think we need more follow-up to, to potentially answer that question. I will say there's also a molecular signature that I find really fascinating that hasn't, to the best of my knowledge, undergone prospective validation, but for which we have cool retrospective data I want to bring up, and this is called the polar or polar um, signature. And so the, these investigators started with a Swedish randomized trial of radiotherapy. They collected tumor blocks that were available because we already had you know, annotated clinical data on these patients. They prepared tissue microarrays and they identified gene sets that were related to local regional recurrence. And they created this gene signature, we'll call polar, and then validated it internally on a separate set of patients within this Swedish trial. The gene themes in this set were not just proliferation like we see in many of our other signatures, but also immune response. What we saw was that polar was prognostic, that the 10 year rate of local regional recurrence was higher in patients with a high risk polar score than with a low risk polar score. But more intriguingly, it was also predictive. Patients with a low risk polar score derived no benefit from radiotherapy, whereas those patients with a high risk polar score derived a substantial benefit from radiotherapy. And this is something we haven't seen in these other data sets, which is not just being prognostic for recurrence, but predictive of radiotherapy benefit. So there was a validation of polar, a 
uh, presented at San Antonio a couple years ago, and I don't believe has been published in a peer reviewed journal yet, looking at that same Swedish trial and then two other trials, a Canadian and a Scottish trial that, of randomization of radiotherapy, again getting tissue samples, running this microarray, and again looking at this polar test. And again, it proved to be both prognostic and predictive, um, in which patients with a high risk polar score derived a substantial benefit from radiotherapy, and those with a low risk polar score not only had low risk, but did not appear to derive a benefit from radiotherapy. And so I will say, will we see in breast cancer that we're making use not just of clinical pathologic variables, but also of molecular variables? I'm almost certain that answer is yet. Yes, I don't think we know yet what signature we're going to be using in these low risk ER positive patients, or even if the optimal signature has been tested yet, but I'm almost certain we're going to be using it. And then I guess I should also, also mention one other thing, which is that the Europeans are a little ahead in asking a slightly different but really intriguing question, which is which of these low risk patients who, for whom we should undergo de-escalation should de-escalate radiotherapy, and which should de-escalate endocrine therapy? And this question is really driven by the fact that radiotherapy has gotten so much better that instead of taking six and a half weeks and being associated with a fair amount of acute and late toxicity, partial breast radiotherapy now takes one week and is associated with very low rates of acute and late toxicity. And the Europa trial is randomizing older patients to either these short course partial breast radiotherapy or five years of endocrine therapy and looking not just at recurrence, but at a series of quality of life outcomes to see whether, at least in some of these patients, de-escalation should be de-escalating something other than radiotherapy. Having said that, regardless of exactly what we de-escalate, I think de-escalation is the wave of the future for ever so many breast cancer patients who are doing extremely well with current regimens. And I think this includes both patients who have excellent responses to systemic therapy and those patients with indolent and hormone receptor positive breast cancers. I hope I've given you a sense of the direction the field's going in. And at this point, I'll uh, let you good people rest and open the floor for questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Dr. Strauss. Um, I was wondering for the polar signature, it sounds like um, it sounds like from what you're presenting with this polar being validated already, then do um, you think it's ready for prognostic evaluation then? I, I think I would feel more comfortable with a prospective study of the polar oh, signature. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean prognostic, I mean prospective evaluation then. Oh yeah, I definitely think it deserves a prospective evaluation. And for me, there's also a question, which is if we're gonna use one of these other pros signatures that are in prospective validation, does Polar add additional information on top of it? I mean, could we use some of the prognostic information from one signature and add some of this predictive information from Polar? I just think there's a lot of questions that remain to be answered, but this is the first one that has shown predictive capacity. And I just think that's awfully important, even though it doesn't get a lot of discussion because it has no prospective study as of yet. Thanks. Hey, Jonathan, can you make a few comments about the different uh schedules that are now being employed, you know, classically five weeks, five treatments a week. And, you know, we've, we've gone to very different things and how do we select, uh, I'm talking more in the breast realm now. Absolutely. And I will say this is a really timely question because I got back from Astro on Tuesday where we had a big American trial present on this very topic. And so I'll back up and say, you know, when I was in training everybody got six and a half weeks of radiotherapy and we used what we called conventional fractionation so small doses each day for lots of days our volume always encompassed the whole breast and was followed by boost but what we have found is we can both use somewhat larger doses each day for fewer days and we can decrease volume and if we look astro has come out with a series sequential series of statements about who's eligible for partial breast irradiation and those statements have continued each time to expand the population so that now most patients with kind of low risk node negative disease are eligible for partial breast irradiation and people are doing these in regimens that range from three weeks to one week 
And I personally always use a one week regimen. So a five fraction regimen for partial breast irradiation. And that's most patients now with no negative disease who got breast conservation, treating in five fractions with partial breast irradiation with extremely low doses to adjacent organs. And so very low doses, low rates of, of real late toxicity. And also with really good acute skin reactions, the, the big blistering sunburns are a thing of the past. Um, so nowadays, anyone who's getting partial breast radiation, at least I'm treating with a one week approach, people who are getting whole breast radiotherapy, we can now give the boost at the same time. So instead of three weeks and a boost afterwards, they now go at the same time and we can do that in three weeks. And what about people where we're treating the regional nodes or post mastectomy? Well, we now have a few trials of regional nodal irradiation and post mastectomy irradiation showing moderate hypofractionation. So a three-week approach is just as good. So we had a couple of European trials present at ASTRO in the last couple of years, and we now had a post mastectomy only trial present at ASTRO. And whether we look at local recurrence, acute toxicity, late toxicity, lymphedema, every outcome is equivalent. So as of the, I was now for quite a while now offering moderate hypofractionation to every single patient I was treating nodes or doing post mastectomy. I'm now changing that up and I'm going to now offer only moderate hypofractionation as opposed to offering conventional. And I assume, you know, the MCCN still has still listed conventional fractionation for patients who have autologous, or excuse me, for patients who have any post mastectomy reconstruction. And I imagine that now that the RT charm trial just presented, NCC will probably open up and this will be, everybody will now be eligible for moderate hypofractionation. So, so really we're getting a lot shorter and getting a lot shorter has reduced the burden of care on all these patients. So, you know, the logistical burden, it also, by the way, reduces cost. It also, by the way, reduces reimbursement. So it's a big part of the reason we've been reluctant to adopt these techniques nationally is because we do all the same amount of work and we just get paid a lot less. And so one thing that our field will have to work on, I think, to really encourage adoption across the country is some tweak in reimbursement models where it isn't that you do all the work up front, but you mostly get paid for the treatments out back. We'll probably have to change that in order to get uptake better across the country. But the data are there. It's time for hypofractionation for everyone. So that said, you know, just thinking on uh, small terms, our own hospital network, do you envision that this will be something that, number one, can be easily done across any of the places in our network? And number two, you know, as you said, this will have to be, there will have to be uptake by your colleagues to do this. Do you think both those things are likely? Well, I would say first, can it be delivered? Absolutely, it can, it can be delivered by anyone. I will say we do have a set of guidelines. We haven't updated in a while, but apply across the network for kind of broad guidelines for what we do. And moderate hypofractionation for everyone has been in those guidelines for years, but so has conventional fractionation. I think the question is, when will we start to kind of push conventional fractionation to the curb and when will everyone be comfortable with it? My suspicion is that that's going to be when our term publishes, but I'm not sure. I think we're going to, you know, so because a lot of people haven't been very comfortable with it yet. Um, I think we're going to need that. And I think we'll need some departmental understanding that at least with payment models now, you know, it's going to be good for patients. It's going to be a little tougher on the bottom line. Um, and so we'll need some administrative probably support for that approach too. I can't speak for all my colleagues, but I do think it's coming within the next year. Other questions? So Jonathan Hyde. Hey, Sue. It's Sue. Great job. Um, how often in, in reality, how often do you see late sequelae, like cardiac toxicities in, in these women that you radiate? So, you know, short answer is, I think we're doing great on cardiac stuff. And longer answer is um, we have some really cool data on this point. Um, and we can look at this in a variety of ways. So big picture, we can look at things like the SEER database. And we can, we didn't know radiation dose, but we can use something like laterality as a surrogate for dose. So when we treated the left side, we know we gave a higher heart dose than when we treated the right side. And we can just look at people who got breast conservation radiotherapy and compare them to equivalent people who got mastectomy. 
And in the olden days, what you could see was the rate of cardiac death was a little, but detectably, higher for people who got left-sided breast radiation than right, higher for people who got breast conservation as compared to mastectomy. You had to follow for a long time, but you could see it. In modern decades, so like after the 90s, that effect is gone. You can't detect it anymore. Mm. And I think some of that is better radiotherapy. Some of that's probably better cardiac care too, honestly. And I'll, I'll give one example of that before I go into a little more depth. I, I once treated a patient, this was before we had deep breath hole, before we were doing good heart sparing, which we started doing 11 years ago. So I treated her maybe 13 years ago. She had a really high risk cancer. I treated her, she had a high heart dose, unfortunately. I saw her follow up like five years later and she said, yeah, I had this weird thing happen where my, I had a dissection of my LED <laughs> and I went and looked, looked it up. And sure enough, it was right in my field way back in the day, you know, breast cancer was here, but I'm sure this was partly my fault. And, but you know what happened? She left because like the cardiac team saved her and she was fine. She wouldn't show up and see her anymore. You know, yeah. so, so part of what's going on, I think is like, we're getting better. And part of what's going on, honestly, I think the cardiac people are getting better. Having said that, let's drill down a little bit. We could see from older series that have like, there's this great Swedish series that had a rough estimation of heart dose. And what you could see was the cardiac risk that we gave was like linearly related to heart dose. The more heart dose we gave, the more risk, the less heart dose we gave, the less risk. We could see um, on these, if we did perfusion studies of the heart before radiotherapy and a year afterwards, what you could see was perfusion changes right in the piece of the heart that got radiotherapy, which was like the apex of the left ventricle. If you did angiography, you could see an elevated risk of a stenosis right in the piece of the coronary artery that was in the field. You know, none of this is shocking, but it makes perfect sense. You could correlate, there's cool Swedish data, you correlate the field of radiotherapy and where it hit a coronary artery to the likelihood of stenosis in that coronary artery in that same, in that same place. Then what we did was just totally exclude the heart from the primary beams, which we did with more careful planning and deep inspiration breath hold and other things. Went back and did the same studies, all those effects were gone. And so our heart dose now is about one order of magnitude lower than it used to be. Patients I used to give seven gray mean heart dose, I now give about 0 0.7. And none of the heart gets high dose anymore. And I think we're below the threshold where we're either causing risk or at least risk that we can measure. So we haven't fixed every problem. But the heart problem, I honestly think we fix, at least for people doing active heart sparing. When we started our deep breath program in 2013, we were the second hospital in Illinois. There was only U of C and then us. Nowadays, it's everybody. Everybody does this. And so you know, it, it's nice or almost everybody. You can really feel comfortable now that most patients are getting active heart sparing. So I really think that's a problem that's gone. Not every problem is gone. We still contribute to lymphedema risk. Um, there may be ways to ameliorate that, but not perfect. The biggest improvement there is fewer axillary dissections. We, we still contribute to some pneumonitis risk. And I actually think that may have gotten higher because mon the interaction between radiotherapy and some of these new fancy systemic therapies are worrisome to me. You know, you look at something like in HER2, which we're not yet giving in the adjuvant setting, but that has a real rate of pneumonitis interstitial disease on its own. I'm a little worried about how radiotherapy is going to interact with that. So I still think we have things to worry about, but heart dose we're doing awfully well on. Great. Thank you. Sure. It's a great question. Any other questions for Jonathan? Well, if not, Jonathan, thanks again for a great talk. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to bring us up to date on these things. And uh, everybody, if you need credit, please sign in as uh, the, the number uh, that was given to you. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Have for a good the Thanks. We have grand rounds next week, too. So come back. <laughs>